All right, boys and girls, we have a very special episode for you today. We've had a lot of amazing guests join us here at Impact Theory, and the team here has put together their most amazing hacks into one compilation that I know you guys are going to enjoy. But please go beyond the enjoyment and actually put some of this stuff to use because that, my friends, is the key to success. All right, without further ado, take a look at our first hack. Hack number one, how to never worry again. I want to start with something we can all uh, relate to, and that is how do you stop worrying and how do you stop listening to self-doubt? This is how you're going to do it. So all day long, you're going to have moments where your thoughts drift, and I use that word on purpose. Because for me, there is a physical sensation when you start to use the five second rule and you start to wake up, mm. not only on time in the morning, but you wake up to your life and the opportunities in your life. There's your thoughts drift. Like you'll just be hanging out with your friends and then suddenly you're like, I'm not sure that that person likes me anymore. <laughs> you know, I haven't heard from my kids lately. I wonder if they're dead or, you know, oh, you know, it's like check. Like you just start worrying about stuff. Mm. Why? Because it's a habit. Because when you're not paying attention, your brain shifts from you being a decision maker and paying attention to you just kind of spinning things on autopilot, and one of your habits is worrying. The second you wake up and you notice, holy cow, I'm talking some negative garbage to myself right now. Mm. Five, four, three, two, one. You've just shifted the part of the brain that you're using. You've shifted from the basal ganglia, which is where your habit loops are spinning, and you've awakened your prefrontal cortex. You've also interrupted that pattern. Now what you're going to do, because your mind is actually ready to receive a different thought because of the counting, now you can put in an anchor thought. Like if you have a mantra, if you've got a vision about the way that your business is gonna turn out in five years, if you just have a thought that makes you really happy and proud, insert that. Now, why does this work? It works because of the counting. And I'm not kidding. We know, based on research, that positive thinking alone, not effective. In some instances, trying to force yourself to think positive can actually make the worries worse. Why? Well, the reason why is because it's really hard to just change the channel. What we have to do first is basically interrupt it and turn off the TV and then turn it back on with the prefrontal cortex awakened. So the counting is essential. And so you can start using this today. You catch yourself talking garbage to yourself, five, four, three, two, one, switch it back. Get back to that vision that you have about toasting your success or this customer being really happy or you being proud of yourself. Mm. Whatever that vision may be, you can control your thoughts. And this is not just us talking about it. This is a tool that you can use. Hack number two, how to set better goals. The first question you ask yourself to identify your end goals is what experiences do I want to have in life? Mm. And this is where you start writing down your experiences. And um, you know, when I do this exercise, I ask people to take out a piece of paper, draw three columns. So if you're watching, do that right now. Take out a piece of paper, three columns. Top of the first column, you're going to write down experiences, right? And ask yourself, what experiences do I want to have? Who do I want to wake up with? What type of house do I want to live in? What countries do I want to visit? Where do I want to um, travel to? What adventures do I want to have? Whether it's climbing Mount Kinabalu or hiking the Andes. What type of family life do I want? What dog do I want? The beautiful thing about experiences is often they don't require that much money. It's crazy. We associate money with happiness, but often the most beautiful experiences in life require no money. Almost any human being today can fall in love, can make a baby. These are some of the most profound experiences I've had. So the first thing is you make a list of your experiences. Now the second thing is you ask yourself this question. For me to be the man or woman who has all of these experiences, how do I have to grow? And here we come to the second list. See, I believe we are souls having a human experience here on planet Earth. But these souls are not just here to explore all of these wonderful things about being human. I believe as, as souls, as human beings, we crave growth. Human beings are growth-driven machines. And so you make that second list. And that second list is, how do I want to grow? How can I learn to be a better father, a better spouse, a better lover? What languages do you want to learn? Do you want to learn a musical instrument? Do you want to learn to write? Do you want to learn um, to play a particular sport or learn a particular skill? 
What many people don't realize about the world is that growth is a goal in itself. It's one of the key things that drive us forward as human beings. But very few people write down growth as goals. It's because the education system, which tries to teach us to grow through forced learning, makes many people dread learning. So growth becomes that second list. Now you have two lists, your experiences and your growth. Now you ask yourself the third question. And the third question is this, to be that man or woman, who has all of these experiences, to be that man or woman who has grown in such a way, how can I give back to the world? And there's a very important reason for that question. The Dalai Lama said, if you wanna be happy, make other people happy. And I believe that when you do these three most important questions, that third category is what truly leads to fulfillment. It's when you can take your growth, you can take your experiences and contribute to fellow souls, contribute to the human race. You've learned entrepreneurship, great, mentor someone, mentor a kid who wants to get there. You, um, you have the ability to um, sing, figure out how to use it to deliver you know, beautiful music, to inspire people. So your list of contributions becomes your steps for you to give back to the world because that takes you beyond pure happiness into fulfillment. Now, when you have this list, experiences, growth, and contribution, this becomes your goal list. Everything else is just a means goal. Now, when I started creating this, I found that it allowed me to rewire my brain, to shortcut and bypass so many bullshit rules to go straight to these final items, to go straight to ways I could contribute, ways I could grow, ways I could have these beautiful experiences. And often these were unconventional parts. Like when I started my company, I didn't work with any investors or VCs. Um, I decided to start my own university, which is happening in Barcelona, but it all came because when you have done the three most important questions, you get to short circuit the rules of the culture scape and figure out shorter paths towards true human fulfillment. Hack number three, how to master self-awareness. I, after that, wrote this thing called a discourse on truth. Right, and I had, I had it bound up wow. at Kinko's and it looked really nice and I had the perfect font and I got A4 paper <laughs> and I, I, I made like 100 copies of it. And it was this like very highfalutin, kind of very pretentious, worded thing that went through truth and ways to know it and things like that. And I gave it to all my family and my friends wow. who were like, you know, what is this thing? You know, this looks like you just, you know. So, but it was so important for me. And when you, when you learn how to, uh, to listen to your own story and write it down, I think self-awareness is like an inevitable byproduct of that mm. because you get addicted to knowing what you think about something. Yeah, I think there's this weird state we all have. You know, we're operating on old memories and we're operating on things that we read but we haven't really like retained. As soon as you start transferring that whole messy, cloudy, misty, uh, area of knowledge into explicit knowledge, you're going to start seeing a lot more in yourself and what's out there. Uh, and so my advice is to write, just write, and the rest will follow. Hack number four, how to have a balanced life. And I've always been a very reflective person. I've always been someone who will ask myself, you know, every six weeks or so, am I happy? Just, and it's a really simple yeah. thing. It's just like, it's, it's either, the answers are either yes um, or no. And I mean, that's, you know what I mean? <laughs> and if it's a no, it's like, okay, well, am I doing things that while right now, maybe I'm not like blissfully happy, are working towards something that I know will make me happy? Mm. You know what I mean? Like, and am I generally happy with the idea of the trade-offs that I'm making right now or that I have to deal with? You know, does that make me happy? Um, and if that's a yes, it's like, okay, cool. But if it's still a no, it's like, oh, stop everything. Nope, this doesn't make sense. Um, and so I've always been the kind of person who would check in again because I feel like- Do you have a like system for thing. that? Like where you literally just say, every morning I'm gonna ask myself this or- No, I mean, I think there are two systems I really have. One was the check-in, which I do just, it's more like you can sense if you take some time to be quiet. Mm. You can sense when you're not in equilibrium, and then that's when you ask. That's it. Like, you should just running, 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 running without taking a, 
a time to just figure your know where you are. I mean, then there's probably going to be other symptoms when you're just overeating or overdoing this or not sleeping. Like you, people will be able to tell you, yeah, you don't look balanced if you asked, if you asked them. So like that's the time to ask yourself. And then the second thing is a list. And the key thing about that list is it's always more than what I could ever reasonably accomplish in that day because. I like to push myself. Mm. You always end up accomplishing still more than what you think. And I, I like to never feel satisfied with myself. And I've been doing those two things for 10 years and that's why I'm here. Hack number five, how to test the impossible. Now, one of the promises in the, um, the press kit was that you could test the impossible in 17 questions. Yeah. What are, what are some of the questions? So the questions are, uh, actual questions that coincided with milestones or inflection points or just a fork in my own life. And some of them would be, for instance, what if I did the opposite for 48 hours? It's a very recoverable experiment. Right? If it doesn't work, then I can always go back to what I was doing. Doing the opposite meant making my calls between, let's just say, 6.30 and 8.30 and then 5.30 to 7, 7.30. And uh, it was just a hypothesis. Uh, maybe I can get a hold of the people I need to get a hold of more effectively when the gatekeepers aren't there. Right. And that's exactly what happened. Wow. And I started booking more meetings and closing more deals than, than the majority of the guys in the company. And it was just from asking that question. What if I did the opposite for 48 hours? And you can apply that to many, many things. Right? Some of the others uh, would be, well, this is one I asked in 2004. You know, if, if I had a gun against my head and could only work two hours per week, what would I do? I, I know it's impossible, what would I do? And that type of ludicrous question was necessary to break my thinking patterns and test, stress test my own assumptions of what was possible. And you find that that is a learnable skill. I'll give you another question that I think you'll really like, which is one of the 17. What can I learn from the people I hate the most? Wow. Now this does two things. It forces you to separate your morality from your, your search for effectiveness. Right. It also helps you to develop some degree of empathy. And uh, those two are very powerful. So what can I learn from the people I hate most? Wow. Uh, is a very, very useful practice. So I'll journal on that very often. In terms of patterns, we were talking about some of the things I've spotted. Meditation or journaling are performed by close to 100% mm. of the people that I interviewed. Hack number six, how to learn something new. You said that once you decided that you had found a real problem, that you began reading voraciously on the topic. How do you approach, like, in fact, give us the real example of this. Like, when you decide that you're gonna get into that, how, how do you learn about it? Like, your knowledge on the subject now is, is huge. If you are an expert in that field, my best advice is not to go do something in the space that you know a lot about. If you are an expert, you are only able to make an incremental improvement to the things that are already being done. So I always tend to, this is my because seventh- Because you've limited your own way of thinking? Because you take many of the things as granted. That means the foundational things that you have, you take them as you granted. Don't question you them. don't even question them. That is how, how it is done. When you come from outside the industry, you're able to question every single thing that people have taken it for granted. Mm -hmm. So if you think about, this is my seventh company and I have never started, it's, it's no two companies have ever been in the same industry. Wow. Right? When I started space, I had no idea how is somebody is going to go to the moon. My first question when somebody asked me that was, I have no idea, it keeps moving. <laughs> Every time I target, it moves. <laughs> then I understood there is orbital dynamics around it, right. right? That became really easy. So I was known as the space junkie because I started to learn about space. And then when I saw this technology at Los Alamos National Lab, that they're able to analyze the body, every single thing that's going inside, it was fascinating enough, then I said, you know what, I am going to go start reading. And when I go, my first approach is to go find 
10, 20 books that I can read. I never like to read one book because then you are more or less that person's belief right. system becomes your belief system. Yeah. So what I do is I read 20 different authors because then I want to see where the people differ from. So I can form the opinion because now I know what everyone else is saying. Mm. Then I start reading all the science journals. What do you do when you encounter something though that you don't understand? Like so the, the microbiome is so vast. So the thing is, you, un, you need to understand the basic vocabulary. So as you know, I'm also on the board of Singularity University. Mm. And being on the board of Singularity University, it gives me the basic background of what is genetics, what is epigenetics, what is the nanotechnology, what is the neuroscience. And the basic vocabulary, once you have that, you're able to make a lot more sense when you read the articles, when you read the books. And then what I do is in each subject, that when I'm learning, I set my Twitter feed only for the science journal, only in that field. That means I'm gonna be looking at the science magazine, the new scientists and every single science magazine that has the articles about that subject. And when I wake up in the morning, I get up around 4.30 in the morning, and I spend the first two hours just going through every science journal, what has come out since I went to bed. I love that. Right? And then once I know that, then I start to learn and start to ask people. I would call the authors of the book. I'll meet the people. How and often do, do they take your call because you're Naveen Jain though? Or like, could anybody do it? So the, more often than not, you reach, uh, you know, you reach out to them on social media. And I would say 90%- I love how socially savvy you are, it's awesome. 90% of the time you reach out to people on LinkedIn, you reach out to them on Facebook, or you reach out, out to them on Twitter and say, I just finished reading your book, really loved the following section. I have, the, I have one thought, I wanna run it, run it by you and see what you think of it. Very rarely gonna, if somebody's gonna say, no, I don't wanna talk to you. Right? <laughs> so pe people will say, send me your thought, and here's my email and that's how you start the conversation, right. right? Hack number seven, how to enjoy rejection. I love to say this, especially to entrepreneurs. One of the great secrets in life to becoming successful, whether it's in a business, whether it's working with someone or for someone or in your own personal life, and I learned this selling encyclopedias door to door in my early 20s, is be prepared in life for a lot of rejection. Because if you're prepared for a lot of rejection and it comes, you don't get turned off, you don't get disappointed, like, well, I'm not gonna do this anymore, no one thinks it's a good idea. It's like, I, I say selling encyclopedias, knock on 100 doors, they slam them in your face. You must be just as enthusiastic on door number 101 as door number one. And that's one of the real secrets. And growing up as kids in downtown LA, we all knew that. We didn't have a lot. We knew there's a lot of things that are gonna turn you down. At seven, trying to sell a flower pot on the street. Most people said no, but it's only 50 cents. No, no, no. Soon a waitress in a little restaurant said, only 50 cents, that's really great. She bought it from us. And we went and built another one. <laughs> That, you don't that, give up. That really is like one of the secrets to the universe, in my opinion, that ability to stay as enthusiastic on door 101 as you were on door one when you've That's had it good. slammed in your face over and over and over. How, can, is that something you can teach? Like, in fact, have you parted that onto your kids? Like, is that something that they've adopted? And if so, how did you pull that off? Definitely, it's just like your viewers of your fabulous show here. They've just heard me say that. Now, if they write that on a piece of paper, be prepared for a lot of rejection. Whether it's in their personal life, that someone says, you're too old, you're too fat, you're too young, you're not gonna do anything other than yes. You've got holes in your nose, you've got things coming out your ears. Whatever is other than yes, this is wonderful. Realize that's gonna happen in life. As soon as people know that, when something goes wrong, they look at a piece of paper, oh yeah, that reminds me. The other quote that I give people a lot, especially entrepreneurs, uh, is any business you're in, whether it's a service, or whether it's a product, or anybody you work with that has a product or a service, always make sure that your product or your service is of the highest quality you could ever make it because you do not want to be, you do not want to be in the selling business. You want to be in the reorder business. Granted, you've got to tell somebody what your idea is right. and, you know, and how it's going to cure something they may need, but the quality has to be so good that after that they want to reorder it, or if it's a one-time item, tell friends about it. And if people think, and whatever they're doing in life, be in the reorder business, whether it's with a personal relationship, whatever you see right now, you're gonna see again and again and again, it's gonna enhance, there'll be ups and downs. Here's my product, it's so darn good, you're gonna use it. Uh, we started Paul Mitchell, we had no money, but we knew our product was so darn good 
that if we got in the hands of enough people, they're going to be reordering it because it was that quality. Service the same way. Hack number eight, how to create a comeback. What advice would you give to somebody in your shoes, a mm-hmm. true world-class athlete? They've had this catastrophic injury. Mm-hmm. What, what's your advice to them? In, in that moment of uncertainty, when they don't know if they're going to be able to come back or not. I think really it's acceptance is, is where you need to end up. You talk about it in stages of grief. Mm. Um, you know, everyone talks about injury as kind of like the stages of grief after death, um, almost and not to be that dramatic. But to realize that it's okay how you're feeling and kick, scream, cry, do whatever it is you need to do, let it out, but give yourself a time limit. So I said after my injury, so I had, and and I was miserable and I was, you know, just a bear to be around, but I told myself, okay, I'm going to give myself two weeks to be an awful person about this. And then you know what? I'm going to pick up and move on and say, what can I do now in this scenario? And really what it was and what I found is I cut myself off and then I looked at how can I make the best of of this situation? And for me, that ended up in being able to do commentary work and being able to be on the course, be on the sidelines, support my fellow athletes and actually take joy in their, in, in their accomplishments, in their victories, instead of seeing them as competitors. Right. And so it's about reframing what you can do in that moment. Mm. For instance, I realized very early on when I was trying to become an attorney that I always had this notion that I wanted to be a prosecutor and on, and on stage and things like that. And I realized I don't do public speaking very well. And that it would seize up, and it was awful for me. That's so I had. Because I've seen you do public speaking very, very well. But it's one of those things that I've had to cultivate, mm. and it's one of those things that I've had to practice. And so, I think that that the hard things, you know, give you cultivate that mental toughness. And people say, okay, well, how do I how do I make it a habit, or how yeah. do I? how do I cultivate mental toughness? And I say, that, well, that's what you do. You make it a habit, is that you don't give yourself the option. And something, you, you pick something, put it into your routine, whether it's waking thir- up 30 minutes earlier every day so you can actually get out the door to move your body. And you just don't think about it. You don't give yourself the option to not do it. To me, it's celebrating the little victories, mm. for sure. Um, the first time that and I- And letting those build like momentum and confidence yes, in you? Yes, for sure. Because every single little victory is going to create that bigger sense of, of self. So that first run back where I did a mile and it was like high five. I felt like I had just run a hundred miles, but it was that little wave that just mm that if you can keep building on those, and unfortunately it's never gonna be a smooth linear, linear progression. And so those little setbacks are the times where you need to realize, okay, it's just a blip on the radar. And so you're just kinda gonna look like this, but as long as you can kinda see that goal towards the end and embrace that process, that's really how I've been rebuilding it. Hack number nine, how to come up with business ideas. You said that it takes nothing more than insight and drive to be successful. And then the, the question that like screamed out of my mind was, can you train to be more insightful? Absolutely. All right, how do you do that? So here's a simple exercise for everybody watching. And I guarantee you that 30 days from today, from when you watch this, you will have more deal flow than any venture capital firm in Silicon Valley. Take a piece of paper and today write three problems in your life. I traffic this morning, you know, I forgot to take my medicine, whatever it might be. But do this every day for a month. Because what you're gonna find is the first day it's kinda easy. Maybe the second day. But after that, you're gonna like, okay, I wrote down my problems. So what else is a problem that you aren't identifying because you've accepted that's the way it is, that's the way it's always been that. You know, you work at a big corporation, well, this is the way we do it. Well, you're gonna go out of business doing that. Mm. And then when you have those 90 ideas, What are you passionate about and what affects the most people? And the intersection of those two 
In your life, you were passionate about nutrition, that it could change people's lives, okay? And you saw a way that you could financially impact them with a healthy bar. Right. And those intersections led to success. Your insight got you there and you solved for a whole bunch of people. No one sells a product. No one buys something, you know. You know, no one went into a store and bought a quarter inch drill bit because they wanted a quarter inch drill bit. They wanted a quarter inch hole. Right. <laughs> right? Very well said. Yeah. Somebody made the drill bit because you wanted a hole, okay? Right. So fill those holes. That's all that's as simple as it can be. Hack number 10, how to find happiness. So most of what we've talked about today is in your book. Just amazing, read this book. Um, but there's one thing that I've heard you mention, which is a two-year study you're doing on happiness, which you didn't talk about in the book. Didn't, yeah. Do you have any nuggets that you're ready to talk about? Yeah, so I have one course on that already. It's called The Power of Happiness. And it's like a, it's 10 different steps that we've just started learning about. Um, but I will give you one just to start off with right now. And it's this, it's um, called, I call it the skill, the chart of happiness. So we end up thinking that happiness comes with the big vacation once a year or the big blowout things once every month. We don't realize that actually happiness comes in these very, very small moments every day. And actually that is, those are the happiness moments we have to savor. So what I'd highly recommend is for the next few days, sit down and make a chart of everything that you do in your life down to making a steaming hot cup of coffee, down to going for a run, down to doing laundry. And then I want you to rank each of those things on how happy they make you. And I, I don't mean like happiness like euphoric. Sure. I mean like happiness like content with your life. Like I am content doing this. I know this sounds crazy, but even like laundry or cooking, something that we often think of as a chore, can provide a certain amount of contentedness if you look at, that, look at it that way. So I want you to rate all of those skills, and then I want you to count up the number of hours you spend on each of those skills every day. What you'll end up finding is you end up doing what I call happy math. Happy math is basically looking at the fact that we end up spending the majority of our week, you know, 90% of our week, doing tasks that rank as a one or two or three, not very ha happy on the happy scale. And we end up having these really small once a week moments where we're actually happy. But really there are these small little moments. It's, it's having that amazing cup of coffee or um, taking in your view from your window or whatever, these little small things. Those minutes add up and I think it's about slowly hacking how can you add in more and more of those minutes. Um, here's another kind of tip on the happiness stuff that I just realized would be a really easy one to try. So another, I kind of talked about these little moments of happiness. There's also these little moments of unhappiness that as humans, we cannot help but infect our entire life. So you, you know how when you're sitting at a red light and you literally question your entire existence? Is that anyone? Does that ever happen to anyone? Sure. Yeah. Um, so you know, you're sitting at a red light and you're like, why do I sit in traffic? Why do I drive to work? Why do I do what I work? Why am I doing this? Maybe I should quit my job. Maybe I should move to Hawaii. Maybe I shouldn't have a car. Like that's like what happens, you know? So one of the hacks that I have found works really well is taking those small moments and turning them into what I call gratitude totems. So a totem is like a symbol or something to remind you of something. So I have a red light by my house that I get stopped at every single day. It doesn't even matter what time of day. And I used to yell at this red light. I would curse at it. And then I realized, wait a minute. Like this light causes me so much unhappiness. I have such a hard time being grateful. Like every Oprah magazine ever says, be more grateful. Who has time to be grateful, right? Like no one has time to do that. But now I have time. So whenever I am stopped at that red light, for the entire red light, I think about every single thing I'm grateful for. And now I get upset if I do not hit it. Because I know that every time I pull up to that red light, I have a minute and a half, just think about all the things I'm grateful for. Check, I got my gratitude off. I feel nice and good. I flipped a very unhappy moment for me that makes me question driving and cars and my life and turned it into something that actually makes me very appreciative. That is brilliant. I hope you guys enjoyed that. And if you did, be sure to leave a review if you're on iTunes and Stitcher or leave a comment if you're on YouTube. As you know, community is everything to us, so we love hearing from you guys. And if you want to see another compilation show like this, let us know and suggest any topics that you'd like us to cover. And this is a weekly show, so if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care.
Hey everybody, thanks so much for joining us for another episode of Impact Theory. If this content is adding value to your life, our one ask is that you go to iTunes and Stitcher and rate and review. Not only does that help us build this community, which at the end of the day is all we care about, but it also helps us get even more amazing guests on here to share their knowledge with all of us. Thank you guys so much for being a part of this community. And until next time, be legendary, my friends. 